Compañeros, welcome to another edition of the Single Data Partners Podcast. I am Carlos El Chacon, your host, and I am joined today by Mr. Kevin Fiesel. Hello. And we have a, a special guest all the way from Microsoft in Massachusetts, right? Chris Seferlis. Welcome, yeah. sir. Thank you. How's it going? Good. We appreciate you being here. Um, so now a SQL Trail alum, right? Presented at, uh, at our June event uh, on Synapse. We appreciate that. And came back for more punishment uh, <laughs> to, uh, to chat with us uh, today. Yeah, it's good so, stuff. I, I enjoy it. So glad, uh, glad you guys could have me on. Yeah, there you go. So our topic is how to be a good speaker. We have some thoughts, right, on giving uh, presentations. And so um, Kevin has done a number of them. In fact, I remember Kevin's claim to fame, if I'm not mistaken, you did 100 SQL Saturdays in a year. No, not in one year, but uh, over the year. years. Oh, I've over hit, the I've year. broken 100. Okay. You, 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 one year. Uh, that would be that would be crazy. That would be, that's that would be two a week. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a lot. Two and a half a week because there's a bunch of weeks that don't have any. They don't have any. That's right. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that math before I said that out loud. Uh, but you, but We're you doing did, it live, people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh. Over what span was that, Kev? Uh, so that first one goes back to I think it was um actually it would have been 2012. But I didn't really start getting into presenting at SQL Saturdays until 2015. And then 2016, uh, that's when it started becoming like a full-time job. Until 2020 paid. when everything yeah. went crazy. Yeah, right. You don't get paid for SQL Saturdays, you know. <laughs> Is that why the checks haven't come yet? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you might as well write that one off. <laughs> and we were just talking about uh, YouTube videos there before, so yeah, uh, yeah. it all goes. We all have our we all have our thing, right? That we do that uh, you know takes 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 of our time, and energy. But as always, uh, we want to do a couple of things before we get started. So the first is uh, our URL for today's um, episode will be at sqldatapartners.com slash speaking or at sqldatapartners.com slash 232, as this is episode 232, and we're getting up there. And we do have a couple of uh, shout outs. So we want to give uh, shout outs to David Reed, Shane Klotzowski, Tony Angel, Boris Pinsky, Wesley Butler, Miguel Martinez, Morali Kirshna, uh, John Desch, Eric Lund, Saba Rezani, uh, Gerardo Sales, Carl Middlefield, 64 Stevis, Stevis, I'm assuming that's an alias, uh, Vicky Hinton, John Kirschke, Bill Lund, and B. Gargal Saiken. <laughs> That's a tough This one. episode of Carlos Reads the Eye Chart has been brought to you by. <laughs> Seriously. So as always, thanks for giving us a little love on social media or interacting with us. And we apologize if we, as we mispronounce your name, but we do appreciate you, uh, compañeros. Um, okay, so with that, uh, so I don't know that we've announced it on the podcast yet. Uh, but we are trying something new, right? So we're calling it our seasonal series. Uh, we are currently in our uh, uh, the summer series. So these are a, a, a three, I'm not sure if it'll be always be three, but for the summer series, we have three sessions that are tied together. Eugene's doing uh, Power BI sessions and we are doing the second one uh, on Thursday. So if you go to, and all of a sudden I can't remember, sqldatapartners.com, uh, there on the event site, you will see a, a way to register for that and if you'd like to come. So these are, uh, you know, 45 minute sessions, a little, uh, um, you know, much shorter, uh, but something that you can kind of take in in a day, step away, say hello to us if you so choose. And so we invite you uh, to do that. So the, the first one is going to be, well, I guess I say Thursday. So as compañeros are listening to this, so uh, September 2nd is when part two will be. And then September 16th is part three, right? And then we will, we will plan one for the, uh, for the fall. 
Um, and in terms of, and I'm not sure, so, so I see, um, Andy, right? Andy's there. He's not local. But for those, if anybody, if you are local and are listening and want to chime in in terms of what we should do for an in-person event, we're still looking to do something in person in October. And the two options are, one, we can do a Q&A or a podcast recording over lunch. Or two, we can try to have two sessions with lunch in between is what we're kind of looking at right now. So if you have... Uh, if you have a preference as to which one you'd rather do, let us know. Okay, so all of that is window dressing to our topic today. So Chris, I've already mentioned, right, that you're doing a YouTube uh, channel, right, putting out videos. I see, I see your face tagged along with Kevin and Eugene on all the events, right, that are happening here uh, in the fall. It seems that I can't uh, find an event where I don't see the three of you. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so you've been doing uh, quite, a, quite a bit of, of speaking. And so today we wanted to talk a little bit about yeah, putting together a good presentation, right? Thoughts on that as you've done them and, uh, and what it takes. Yeah, so for sure. I guess with that, right, maybe we start open or we, you know, we, we start, I know you have three concepts you wanna go over, but sure. perhaps uh, you know, give us the high level and, and how, and maybe even before we dive into that, right, how speaking has, uh, has helped you, if at all, um, you know, in other areas of your work. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, let's, let's categorize it as this isn't public speaking 101, right? This is, right, we, we assume that if you're looking for something like that, you're going to go to a Toastmasters, you're going to go, you know, take it in a college course or something like that. Um, I, you know, I, I took it in high school. It was kind of a joke because nobody really wanted to do it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so um, this is more, it's, it's, it's very much geared toward like the technical speaker, right? A lot of us are very comfortable in front of a computer screen working on computers. Right. And, and some of us are just a little more gregarious than others. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, somebody told me once that, um, you're an introvert if getting up for something like a speaking engagement or something like that exhausts you, right? And that whole process exhausts you. Whereas you're an extrovert if you get excited about it and you feed off the energy from it and stuff like that. And, and I gotta say, I still don't know which I am because I have situations where both happen, right? Sure. You know, you, you, you get all amped up for an event, you, you, you're, you're all pumped up, you get all the energy, you're, you're ready to kind of deal with hecklers, you're ready to answer questions as quickly as you can, you want to be as sharp as you can, um, and you're just drained because your brain is just fried afterward. And then there's other times when you have just a really, really good group of folks that you're working with, that you're talking to, that you can just feed off the energy because they're excited, right? Um, though, though, you know, I definitely see both. Um, and I guess I started professionally speaking, whatever you want to call that these days, um, you know, a little after Kevin, I guess. So 2014 um, is when I started really kind of exploring SQL Saturdays and things like that as well. Um, a good friend of mine was with Pragmatic Works at the time. And, you know, he kind of turned me on to the sessions and got me interested. And, um, you know, it definitely took it a long way. I, I certainly didn't do 100 over that period of time. But, you know, I was definitely in the 30, 40 range, something like that. I mean, um, it, it was up there. Uh, you know, some of my favorites were definitely like New York City was a, was a great venue. Um, the one we had in Maine was awesome. Um, you know, the speakers, I don't know if any of the folks were there, but and geez, what year was it at this point? Um, but, you know, we, we took a, a boat out to an island, a ferry out to the island and, and had lunch on, or dinner on an island. And it was just, it was awesome, yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and that's the cool thing is, is getting to know some of the folks here, um, you know, get, getting to know faces and names over time and stuff like that. And, you know, to answer your question about what has speaking afforded me, it's it's sort of just the notoriety you know people recognize me more at those types of events um it's you know it's it's just I, I try to put myself out there to people to be able to be a resource to help them in their journey it's not, not easy right I spent over 20 years in IT 
uh, and, and, you know, really trying to dig in and find your answers and things like that isn't always easy. So the broader your network and, and knowing folks who have experience with it um, really goes a long way, you know, and, and I will say, um, I, I directly relate it to the fact that I am at Microsoft now. I've been here a little over two years. Uh, you know, I came in as, as um, what was known as a technology solution professional, technical sales professional, um, where I was sort of bridging the gap between a specialist seller and a cloud solution architect. Um, that role went away and I became a cloud solution architect. Um, but I really enjoyed more of the customer interaction and, and helping customers with those types of things. And so uh, by having that speaking background to, to meeting folks here in the Northeast, like George Walters and Andy Roberts and James Serra, um, and, you know, and some of the real, um, real bigger names that folks know, um, I attribute that to speaking and, and it sort of really helped me in my path. Yeah, I, I think Kevin Wright could you know, chime in. He's going to agree with a lot of those sentiments. Especially about the main speaker dinner. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, and I they mean, haven't done a main since. So I think we just, uh, it was perfect. So we haven't gone back. <laughs> there you go. You know, and I, I think, it's too, well, so less, as my life on the D list, right? I have less notoriety. Uh, although I did give several shout outs, right, to folks uh, saying hello. Um, but the, the one of the pieces that has been helpful for me, and you alluded to it now working for Microsoft, would be access, mm. right? Access to folks that you wouldn't normally have access to, sure. right? And uh, to be able to rub shoulders with them and, you know, share experiences. Um, and, and that I feel like has been, you know, uh, uh, very helpful. Now, there's no question that your speaking experience will vary based on your audience, right? You know, so you talked about the, you know, both ways that you felt. So just in terms of size of audience, where it is, right? Virtual versus in person, you know, right. all, all of those things I think play a role. So again, your, or these things that we talk about today are going to vary, uh, ultimately depend, depending on who your audience is. Right, sure. you know, if uh, and oh my gosh, I'm just having a blank. Sadia, well, I'll give Sadia, a funny anecdote then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say if Sadia so, is in your is in your session, right? You may have a different experience, right? Sure. If it's just the <laughs> could be the three of us there, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, or, the other thing too is is uh, just as a side, like who's not sick of virtual at this point, right? I, I mean, I want to I want to get back in front of people and customers and. Uh, you know, any anything in person event, sign me up these days, uh, just just to kind of get back out and, and feel some normalcy. Right, for sure. There are a couple of in person events that are coming up in November. Um, we may be starting to get some of that, but I think we'll probably see more next year. Yeah. But since I have this uh, anecdote on my mind, since Carlos was talking about you never know who's going to be in your audience, who's going to who's going to uh, it, it may shape the way that the session goes. And I was at a SQL Saturday presenting, I think it was the first time I presented this talk on uh, using data science techniques to optimize backup performance. And I had a fairly small crowd that could be very easily delineated into two groups, crusty old DBAs and uh, data scientists. And I mean that in the most... Uh, <laughs> favorable, happy terms of crusty old DBAs. These guys, uh, no problems with them at all. Um, but during the first half of the session, when I'm going deep into the, the subject matter of you know, the different ways that you can control backup performance, that side of the room was like riveted and this side of the room was bored out of their minds right. the second half when i start getting into well here's the r code that we're going to use here's the process here are the the techniques and here's the analysis this side of the room is literally sleeping and this side of the room is riveted <laughs> right and right. so i had to switch like well over here i'll talk to you folks early on sure. i'll talk to you folks later sure yeah and, and i think that's a great segue into sort of like the first tip that i had um, you know, and, and the basis of this is from a video I had done about a year and a half ago now. It was one of the first videos I put it out on my channel. Um, but no matter what that audience is, um, I, I think a really, really critically important piece is to be yourself. 
Um, you know, it, it's, you're never going to survive if you're, if you're trying to be somebody else. Yeah, your energy might go up a little bit. Your voice inflections might change a little bit, right? Those kinds of things. Um, but the reality is, if, if you're faking it, if you're reading off a teleprompter, if you don't have any experience with a topic and you're being pulled into it, people are going to smell it out pretty quick, right? And, you know, I, I remember... Uh, one, of, one of the first talks I gave when I was at Pragmatic Works at the time, um, and they uh, had me fill in for like a Microsoft US tech conference. Um, and the talk I was giving had nothing to do with data. It was all about like Windows Server 2019 and, and uh, you know, some related services that were coming out at the time and stuff like that, right? There was, it was nothing uh, data related. Fortunately, I had the background in IT, so I could actually commiserate with my audience about building, you know, a, a whatever, a, a storage, um, uh, geez, a file share, like a Windows file share or whatever, right? Yeah. I know the pain of that. So um, I, I, could, I could at least get through that. But, you know, I mean, my brain was totally focused on, on data. And so it, it, I think I must have gone over that talk at least 30 times until I could come up with like at least some relevant examples to talk through with people because otherwise I just felt like I was going to fall on my face. It was super nervous. Whereas if it were giving like a synapse talk or a BI talk or something like that, no problem right off the cuff. So it was, uh, you know, it was, it was really interesting, but yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely be yourself, right? Um, you're always going to have a know-it-all in your sessions. Uh, you guys have probably run into them. Um, some are hecklers, some are dismissers, right? Some will just say something and then totally dismiss anything that you respond with, right? <laughs> um, and, and be open and honest with people, you know, hey, if you don't know an answer or whatever, we'll, we'll get into that a little further, but be willing to listen to what they have to say. You know, maybe their perspective is a little different. Maybe you're misunderstanding each other and stuff like that, but just be willing to hear it out, right? Sure. Yeah, and I think so, so part of this with the, uh, the be yourself, is tr trying to figure out what uh, and I'm going to say voice you want to use in terms of hey am I you know am I going to engage or am I just going to be like you know I'm just going to present right and I call it just you know <laughs> snow snow plowing right sure <laughs> um, which I happen to dislike very much as in my own personal uh, you know no questions right no like I have this thing and I'm going to get through it. Um, but, right, I mean, that's, there are people that like that as well. They just want to get the information, right. you know, they don't want to, you know, the chain of thought or the, you know, to be broken and they just want to, they, they just want to get through it. So, right. you know, it's not to say that, you know, one is better than the other. I have a preference as to which one I like, but again, that's, that's part of, of me and, uh, and, you know, and, and it does, and it does matter. Um, I'm willing to say one's better than the other. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I mean, truthfully, if I have the option um, to give a talk and not get through all my slides, I prefer that, right? Because it tells me, you know, I usually give 10 to 15 minutes for questions at built in to, for how quickly I'm going to rattle my information off. But if I don't get to the end, it means that the, the audience is engaged. They're either asking questions of me, they're discussing amongst themselves. It's the best when you can sit back and let them discuss, right? <laughs> um, you know, because you get other perspectives, you know, and, and I feel like people get more value out of the session, except for that one guy who wants to be talked at and not say anything and just, you know, consume your information, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's a mix, uh, you know, but, but no matter what, I just, you know, do what you do best and, and got you into that position where you wanted to relay that information to the people that are there. Yeah. Another, so another side note that I was thinking about on the be yourself uh, item, and this is, I don't know, more, perhaps more tactical, tactical. Yeah. Is uh, so on your bio slide, I feel of all the slides you should have no bullet points on your bio slide, right? Uh, use pictures. Right, so help tell that story. There, there's going to be enough bullet points right later on, um, but help convey that a little bit. And I think it also will help set expectations from the audience in terms of, okay, right, here's my style. This is what you're getting, right? And then they can decide, right? Well, I like that style, or I'm not, I'm not interested, and maybe I, 
maybe I should go find another session. Yeah, that's an interesting tip, right? It tells a story as opposed to somebody just reading on a slide because I do the bullet points, guilty, right? <laughs> um, but the reality is um, I don't drain the slide either. I just kind of throw it up there. Hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's, um, but that's that's an interesting thought because yeah, you, you get people more engaged, you pull it in. I'm, I'm in my head, I'm, I'm seeing fl pictures flying around the screen, right? And, and landing and <laughs> building that picture for you. So yeah, that's that's an interesting tip. Um, but like anything, right? Um, so I guess you, uh, so you, you have, you have a point here, be, be humble. Right. And, uh, I think we could, well, I, I think the majority, right. And, and, and admittedly the, the data community has kind of forced the issue a little bit, right. There, it's kind of sure. a set some cultural expectations. Um, but I know this is, I feel like this is a, probably a, a, a bigger problem in other, uh, in other communities but yeah nobody nobody likes the know-it-all right presenter right uh either i feel like yeah no I totally agree it's uh i think it's it's an important thing to be able to connect with the audience and if you're humble it makes it that much easier yeah so then right so you you, you kind of mentioned it earlier but then in terms of audience connection right this is another one that you have to decide what your style is going to be uh, because while you can engage the audience, you then have to be prepared to bring that back, right? <laughs> yeah. And to be yeah. like, okay, right. You guys talk afterwards, right? We're gonna continue. You know, we're gonna, you know, carry on. Yeah, occasionally you have to police that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Right? You know, because uh, you know, you get Kevin Feasel in your in your uh, you know your session, and he's like. Well, I think that uh, you know the F language is the best, and right. everybody should be developing in you know F sharp. And I'm like, whatever, right? Like, I mean, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> but in fairness, I, I usually wouldn't interrupt a session unless it's someone I know, and drop yeah. that knowledge. Other people, <laughs> it's you're gonna have to you're gonna have to earn it, basically. You're gonna have to earn it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you guys know John Miner here in the Northeast, but he loves yeah. heckling me in my sessions. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, kind of so, wrapping yeah. wrapping up the be yourself thing. Um, one way that you, you could phrase it is uh, you you have to kind of hit a minimum threshold uh, to be interesting, and that threshold is sort of a combination of practice charm and chutzpah yeah. so like chris mentioned hey i got this talk where i don't know anything about it i practice it a whole bunch of times and that gets you far enough over the hump i've known people who can take a deck blind and just give an amazing presentation while they're uh catching the slide right beforehand they have incredible charm and most of us don't have that uh, you take like if you're a professional actor, yeah, you can read from that teleprompter. If you're a news person, uh, you you've done it for years and it looks natural when that newscaster is reading from the teleprompter. It does not look natural when we're doing it. Yeah, no, um, no. it takes time and practice. I have to imagine 100 sequel Saturdays. You, you've got some pretty good practice, though, Kevin. Occasionally. Yeah. Uh, but then that's where chutzpah comes in, sure. where sometimes you just got to you just got to do it. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And and you know, the, to the point Carlos made too is you got to be able to cut it off at some point, right? Yeah. If it's if it's totally taking over your session, nobody's going to even remember you gave the session because it was a conversation about you know whatever, right? So the F sharp language. So uh, you know that's that's certainly something that's important. Is you know if if you're completely derailed, be like, hey guys, why don't we just take this offline and, and kind of keep going for sure. Um, and you know, the other thing too, is, is I've asked a lot of people, Hey, why, why don't you, why don't we chat afterward? You know, I'm not going anywhere. Let, let's talk through it. Uh, especially if it becomes a little contentious or something like that. Right. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm all open to criticism. Anybody I work with will tell you anytime, anytime I finish anything up, you know, let me know, how can I do, how can I be better? How can I be better at what I do? Um, it, because if, if I don't hear it from somebody else and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because it seems like everybody wants it, you know? So um, you know, be open to that kind of criticism and feedback, especially when you're starting out, ask people, ask a lot of people, how can I improve? How can I improve? People aren't going to necessarily, uh, I remember there was an article we read, people aren't necessarily going to give you really, really deep criticism unless it's somebody you trust and know really well. So if you know somebody that will come and sit in your session, they'll give you that feedback, definitely, you know, use that to your advantage. 
Um, otherwise, keep it really, really high level and just say, do you have any suggestions for what I just presented, right? As opposed to give me feedback, help me get better. Do you have any suggestions on what I just presented? Uh, and, and a lot of times that'll open up some stuff. Although what I've found for the most part is, is the, the SQL family, DBA community, they're pretty open and honest about how they feel. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, this is kind of feeding into the next point that you've got, Chris. Um, we're talking about, okay, you've got to meet this bar to, to present, to do it well in presentation. But that bar is not really as high as you'd think it is. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to go out there and nail every single word, never flub anything, never say uh or um once, uh, never have a, see, I just did it, never have a demo script that doesn't quite work exactly how you expect it to. It's not about having this pitch perfect movie style procession of information. Right, right. You'll kill yourself if you do that. Right. If you spend all that time, uh, it's not going to be worth all your time, truthfully, because the people that are there are going to have some sense of what you're talking about for the most part anyway. And so they're going to pull out little nuggets. If there's something they don't understand or they want to know more about, most likely they're going to ask you. Right. Uh, and if you know, if, if you spent too long refining and, and trying to get that presentation perfect, um, you know, it, it's just not going to be, there's, there's some equilibrium point where the value of all that time spent is just completely minimal in the overall value of the presentation you're giving. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, quotes, Confucius and a whole bunch of folks about just perfection being the enemy of progress or good or whatever, you know, um, it, it doesn't have to be perfect, especially in that type of event. Now, if you're, you know, giving the uh, state of the state address or state of the union address, it's a little different, right? You, you've got some standards to hold uh, yourself to. But the reality is the majority of us are technologists at these sessions. And I don't think anybody's going to judge you if your demo doesn't work quite right. Um, you know, that breaks. And matter of fact, most of us are going to have sympathy because it's just like, yep, been there. That sucks. You know, um, if, if you say um and ah too much, they're not going to be critical of it, right? It, we all do it, right? So um, yeah, don't beat yourself up about this stuff. Yeah, there are there are limits. There are extremes where if your every other word is a, uh, now we've got a problem. But this is where practice. If you practice it a bit, you get past that threshold of minimum competency necessary, and then the audience becomes very receptive and will work with you. Like classic example at past summit one year everything failed. I think it was the projector that failed or the laptop that failed for a speaker. And he did the entire session on a, a whiteboard yeah. or no, sorry. It wasn't even a whiteboard. It was like an easel with a marker <laughs> and was able to get through his entire talk, which was a fairly deep technical talk, just writing on an easel. Uh, I've had cases where laptops have failed, where projectors have failed. I had one event where the projector bulb exploded had another event where the projector just never worked and there was a little say 21 inch screen on the lectern that I had to flip around and say okay everybody nestle in close because this is all I got but you just deal with it and the audience is okay sure now this does go to a, a point of uh, so I get well so there's preparation but then also the number of times you're going to give the session right so you know you're, the state of the state gets given one time and only one time right like and that's it uh part of what i think the you know the, the journey is and, and in theory the evolution right of of your presentation would be is that you should try you should plan on giving it more than once i, I don't know what the number is in terms of you know your minimum threshold, but there are enough opportunities out there um, to to try and practice it, right? To to go through that, uh, I guess I'm going to say just I'm going to throw out a number, right? Of five times, right? Before you you know decide that this is not for you or that you know you can't you can't improve, um, you know obviously you mentioned it prior, 
in that the the um, you, know, you want to practice beforehand. You want to go through it, right? Your demo might fail, but from a presentation flow perspective, right? You should feel comfortable with how that's going to move forward uh, before you get up there and you're like, oh yeah, this slide, you know, and, and you're kind of mentally transitioning yourself, right, in front of the in front of the audience. You yeah. know, those those yeah. are some things you want to try to avoid. And I and I've seen it handled with with some serious grace. Um, uh, Andy Leonard is a guy that comes to to mind when I think about it. Uh, you know, he gets into some pretty deep demos and stuff. And I, I mean, he would just say, yeah, if my demo were working, you would be seeing X, Y, Z, you know what I mean? And kind of just make it a little humorous and kind of roll through it. Again, it happens. I, I mean, it just happened to me recently, as a matter of fact. So, I mean, it, it happens. Um, there's there's only so much you can do, um, especially when you're working on, you know, some crappy internet somewhere or, you know, you're you're working on a, a cloud only system and things like that, where there is that that potential for failure. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a great point, you know, just just know where you're going to go in, in, in the case where you do have a failure, be able to at least describe through what it is that you want to show and you know maybe back it up with another way of showing it after the fact um the demo is i don't know it, it's hard i don't want to categorize it as being the least important because really when we're building a demo it's the coolness factor a lot of the times and like showing hey look what i did um, but you're providing that code and everything else to, to the users who are consuming it um you know so it's more about how are you delivering it and, and what, are, what are the people getting for a value out of what it is that you're doing i think yeah, for sure. And there are ways in case you do have a, what I might call a higher risk demo, there are certainly ways to mitigate that. You can use screenshots, you could have a video recording of it. Uh, you could have other ways of describing, maybe you've got a lower impact demo that'll get you some of the way there. So, oh, I can't show you how to join this machine to the domain because we're having issues here. So uh, instead we can talk through it and let me share some screenshots of this is the process that you would walk through to join this machine to the domain, or here's the PowerShell script. Yes, it's not running, but we can at least talk through what it does. So there are other techniques available too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I think, um, you know, this last piece, when, when, when folks ask you a question, um, you can't prepare for everything, right? So you're never gonna have every answer that people are gonna throw you. And there are people who just throw questions at you that are totally unrelated to what you're presenting on, you know, and, and you know, they, they're in their own special category of hell, right? So, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the reality is it, it, you can prepare, you can know your material, um, but there are always gonna be those, those questions that come out of nowhere uh, that, that you just don't have an answer to. So uh, don't let it shake you, right? If, if it's something that you think is relevant that you can help help people out with, you know, to say, listen, I'll, I'll follow up with a blog or I'll follow up with a post, shoot me an email with that question. I, I, it's amazing how many people will ask me questions in sessions and I'll say, you know, I don't know the answer offhand. Uh, shoot me an email, I'll try to find you an answer. And 90% and of the time, I never even get that email, you know? And so yeah. it, it's kind of like, you know, from a, from a speaker perspective, you just got to kind of shake it off. Look, I'm going to do what I can to help you out. And then there are people who who do reach out with those questions and I get them the answer and they're very, help, you know, thankful because of it. So, um, sure. yeah, it, if you don't know the answer, shake it off. Yeah, there is another option here. And again, you have to decide what your presentation style and what you're willing to uh, to subject yourself to. Um, but I but depending on the location and user groups are great for this. Again, if you know your audience, if you have, you know, some contact with your audience, opening that up and saying like, well, I'm not sure, but does anybody else here know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've had questions answered that way, or at least thoughts, right? That you're like, okay, well, you know, that's an op you know, that's an option, right? I'm happy to still look it up, but, you know, you may also want to look at what they've suggested. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, depending on how tight the user group is, you know, a group of 15, 20 people, um, y'all know each other pretty well, most likely by now, because you're all showing up month after month. Uh, I mean, obviously not recently, but, uh, and a lot of times people just jump in and be like, Hey, this is how I did it. Or, you know, that's, that's a great point. Right. Um, you know, and, and the other thing too, is, is like you said, you got to bring it back in though. So that, that, uh, it doesn't go too, too crazy either. 
No, 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 that's right. There's, there's a downside to that, to engaging the audience. And, and obviously I think it only works to a certain size, right? Once you get to, I don't know what the number is, but certainly at a hundred people, right? You're, you're too big, I think, to start engaging the audience uh, in that way. And so there are some, there are some downsides to that, but I generally don't have to worry about that because I'm not, my, my audiences are, are a bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Your average user group is 20, 30 people. And that's a, like you said, that's a really good size for getting somebody to step up at a hundred people. I'm almost never going to raise my hand sure. at 20 people. Eh, I probably will say something. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and then jumping in to the last I was going to say one thing before there. So yes. part of that is again, so if you can lead people there, so if you can find ways to engage them, prior to that you'd be more likely if that's the first opportunity for engagement that you're going to have a very low chance of, of engaging but if you've asked questions or had them raise their hand or you know somehow like self-identify right with you know with something or other right now they're they're engaged a little bit right and they they've had that interaction and um i won't say it's 100 percent, but it goes it goes up it depends on the audience um you know, even right. up here. Always, you know, we yeah. threw that out the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, up here, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm doing a user group in New Hampshire or Rhode Island or Connecticut, um, it's a lot different than the user group that I would do in Boston. Um, the audience is different, you know, the um just the way that they interact is different, you know. And so um, you know, it's it's just yeah, it totally depends. Um and then uh, this one, this one really resonates with me i've got uh two girls they're uh they're uh eight and ten um and they're always concerned about what other people think right and uh and the reality is and, and i keep trying to explain this to them and and i mean i've heard you know the some of the greatest speakers in the world have this you know sentiment you know uh, right down to people that are just doing their first user group um discussion is you know, you, you're never going to please everybody, right? It's, I, I, I'm I happy if I get 50%. And and I've seen it time and time again. I'm sure you guys, well, probably not, Kevin, but a lot of us have seen it time and time again, where you get, you know, five that are five stars, you know, perfect score. We love this, blah, blah. And then you get five or like one or two stars and like they'll nitpick, oh, you turned your back to the audience, you know, or, uh, or you move around too much or, you know, just things like that, right? Um, you, you can never please everyone and don't even try, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like these one way things where, um, you know, when you think about like a streaming data workload, right, you've got your data coming in, you want to pick out the important stuff and let the rest go out. Right. And that's it. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, pick out the, the, the stuff that, that might actually benefit you, that might help you get better at what you're doing, uh, and then just let the rest go, right? It, it's just not worth, um, it's not worth spinning your wheels on. Right. But one of the things I, I do think you want to look through in that feedback is, did the, um, and, and the questions sometimes have to be set up this way, but did the audience, I want to say learn, that's kind of a strong word, right? But was there was there knowledge kind of move forward right did so what the what you were trying to convey right here are a couple of the points that i want to show did that resonate um you know that i feel like is the is probably the because we talk about presentation but really at the end of the day we're teaching right we are trying to teach and, and help people understand uh, you know a concept and so i think what you want to focus on is a little bit more of yeah, that your teaching method and is the the pieces that you put together is that resonating with the audience and they understand them right and everything else right like you turned your back too much right you let you ask you know you let too many questions be answered or you know whatever again is is um sometimes can just distractions right they uh, sure you may yeah and, and be able to help. you know that's one thing about feedback right is when we do these sessions, whether it be SQL Saturday or PaaS or, or any of these, you know, conferences that we do, you put out a topic, you put out a description of the topic and what the audience can expect to learn. The best is when you're doing a talk on Databricks and somebody asks why you didn't talk about SQL Server, 
you know, um, <laughs> right. So, and, and I'm obviously being extreme there, but I mean, there are things like that where, you know, it's, it's a beginner level, you know, it's an introductory, it's a high level overview. And, and the person was looking for 400 level and, and, you know, like, well, why didn't you dig deeper on this session? That's one of those things you just kind of let it go. You know what I mean? It's, sure. it's let it go or in and right back out. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the other thing that, that I've um, really taken to is just sort of analyzing when I'm all done and, and you know, sort of you have that high is coming down from being in front of all those people and, and, and just go find a quiet corner. I mean, you're going to be stopped. I mean, I, you know, you generally have people wanting to talk to you on your way out and stuff like that. When you get that chance, break away. Don't go to another session. Break away and then go write your thoughts down, right? Just, just think about everything that was said. Think about the questions that were asked. Think about, you know, where you could have maybe explained something a little better, the order of the slides that you didn't like, all that kind of stuff. Because when you get back to your house later, or, you know, you look at it again a week later or something like that, you're never going to remember all that stuff, you know, unless it's really bad, right? There was a typo, you know, or, or something like that. Um, that it, but, you know, make some notes to yourself, right? It, it's, it's a big part of sort of self-reflection, improvement, things like that. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're never going to be able to fully reduce the ums and ahs and uh, likes and ands and all that stuff. But, it, you know, that, that stuff is so much less important than, you know, making sure you're delivering that message that you want to deliver. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think uh, these have been you know, good points, and you know, I, I think we'd all agree, right, that presenting is ultimately enjoyable. I know some people would disagree with that, yeah. but even even some of the uh, the most introverted people that we've that we've come across have uh, have had good experiences uh, as they've been able to present and share things. Absolutely. Um, you know, we we didn't we didn't really get into this, right? But in terms of length and whatnot. Don't feel like because yours was only 15 minutes, right? That that's somehow discounted, right? Um, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you know, another thing too is you know to that effect is if you don't get chosen for pass this year, put it again for next year, right? Um, yep. It's uh, so I've applied for pass four times and I've never been accepted. <laughs> so you know, it is what it is. I mean, I, I've done hundreds of presentations, but I've never been accepted to to do one at pass, and and it is what it is. Um, but you know, don't take it personally. If you can reach out and say, you know, just curious, they might say, well, we've got six other presentations on this topic, right? Um, you know, whatever. Andy Leonard is, is the, the God of SSIS, you know, we, we can't have another SSIS session, you know, so those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it, you can't take it personally either. They've got so many slots. They've got so much space and so much time. Right. Final thoughts? You know, um, I, I, yeah, I think that covers it pretty well, right? Uh, if, if you really want to hone your craft and, and understand um, where you can improve your speaking in general, that's when you go to a Toastmasters, right? That's when you go to, uh, uh, you know, a, a community college, public speaking course, things like that. Um, they're going to give you all of the real technical techniques, you know, about making eye contact and, and not moving too much, but still moving, not a statue, you know, all of those types of things, um, you know, and there's YouTube channels, there's tons of stuff out there to do it. Um, and, you know, the practice, practice really helps, but don't kill yourself on it for sure. Right. And take everything that we've said with the appropriate understanding that we're still saying, go out and present. You don't have, you don't start out as an expert. Um, you probably are going to be pretty bad at it and that's okay <laughs> because we were all pretty bad at it the first time around. <laughs> Again, none of, none of us here is Tom Cruise. We can't take a script and come out the next day and just nail this thing perfectly. Right. It takes a lot of time, effort, and energy to, build up those skills over time, but those skills are extremely useful. They're going to help you make connections. You're going to understand the source material better than you would otherwise. Teaching is a wonderful way of learning. And it's a way of also pushing yourself into a direction that you might not otherwise have decided that you wanted to get into. Like, for example, I kind of want to learn about this new technology, but 
uh, do I want to spend the time on it? Well, having some sort of commitment exercise. Okay, well, I'm going to teach it to the local user group. It's a low risk commitment exercise, sure. but is enough still to get you to spend that 10, 20 hours learning about the technology so that you can share it with other people who probably haven't seen it before and probably might also be interested. And if they ask questions, of course, sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I'm still pretty new to this thing, but uh, let's go learn about it together. Sure. That's what yeah. it comes down to. Yeah. And you make a great point, Kevin. Go to your user group, right? Start there. Don't start out, you know, at a conference of 500 people, start a user group, you know, start understanding the kind of questions you're going to run into. They're super forgiving. SQL Saturdays, maybe not as a keynote when you've got two, 300 people in front of you, but, you know, in, in a smaller session, 20, 30, 50 people, people are so forgiving and understanding and encouraging, really. Um, I, I couldn't believe my first session. I had like 60 people in it. I was shocked because I was like, who the heck wants to learn about SSRS? It's been around forever, right? And I, I mean, I, they were a great audience. They were engaged. They, you know, they talked me through it. I was shaking like a leaf the whole time. <laughs> like, I was very nervous, you know, um, but, it, but it was a great way to sort of get introduced to it. Uh, and, you know, the user groups are a great way to do it because it's just, it's such a low key environment and people are going to help you out. I mean, they really genuinely want to, and that's why they're going to these things so they can learn and help others out too. Should we do SQL Family? Sure. So when did you first get started with SQL Server? So 2008, I, uh, I started writing some um, stored procedures, pulling data out of uh, Mass 200, which is a, a Sage uh, ERP system, and uh, just started digging in to pull some of the data out to do some reporting started out with SSRS. Um, it was sort of, you know, when 2008 was brand new, uh, SSRS had been around for a few years and, you know, uh, built everything by hand, never even knew what SSIS was. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had to do a lot of it manually and, and a lot of trial and error with, uh, with um, stored procedures and pulling the data across and stuff like that. Uh, and then from there, just, I was hooked, honestly, um, the ability to somewhat surface that information, build in the calculations and be able to pull all that together was, was really exciting for me. What advice would you give to someone looking uh, to pursue a career similar to yours? Oh, you got to put in the work. Um, you know, it, it's, all of all of the video blog, the the speaking, the you know social networking, all of that stuff is all extracurricular. Nobody's going to pay you to do it until you've got enough experience where they can, you know, because it's you're that valuable. Um, it it genuinely takes a lot of work. It's extra hours. It's it's giving up your Saturdays to go to a SQL Saturday or you know drive with. Paresh Motawala for seven hours out to mm -hmm. Rochester, New York. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 putting in the time and uh, and and you know putting up with that stuff. And and that's really you got to be willing to do it if you want to get there. Yeah. What's the one thing that can instantly make your day better? Can I break the rules? Can I have two? <laughs> oh, here we go. Sure. Yeah. So so one is is getting a hug from my kids, right? Um, they 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 can read you pretty quick, right? I mean, they can. They can see it if you're stressed out and stuff like that. And, and they do. And they'll come up and they'll just give me a big hug and a kiss. And, and it's it's just the sweetest thing ever. And it really just kind of melts me. But then the other one is is just cranking some tunes, right? Uh, something upbeat. You know, I, I, do, I do a lot of country, do a lot of rock. Um, just something upbeat kind of gets you, you know, your blood pumping and get you into the mood um, where you can just kind of make anything that just happened that was go away pretty quick. You've got ten thousand dollars. What computer technology would you purchase? So this one's tough because I, I'm I'm definitely a tech geek. Um, you guys can't see my office because I'm I'm you know on my, on my screen here, but I've got yeah. you know five monitors surrounding me right now, plus a couple of laptops and all that. So from a tech standpoint, um, I, I've got a lot of that covered. 
Uh, I did recently get a uh, Mavic Air 2 drone mm. uh, and, it, you know, the mini, I, I, sorry, the mini one. Um, and the thing is awesome, right? It, it's like the video quality is so good. It's super fast. Um, so if, if I could just spend money on something tech related, I'd probably get like a higher end drone to be able to do like some some cool video footage and stuff like that. Um, do a lot of hiking up here in the Northeast and stuff and being able to capture like the mountains and all that is just, it's really, really cool. So I'd probably get something like that, honestly. Which just stay out of national parks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you can fly them, right? I mean, so that's the thing now is um, up here, I was by Lake Winnipesaukee, which is has an airport near it. Um, and, and I hit a ceiling at like, probably 20, 30 feet. Um, uh, we were on the side of a mountain and, and, and basically, you know, I was in a no fly zone. I couldn't fly it any higher. So, yeah. uh, you know, those kinds of things that you run into too. Um, yeah. So across the entire U S um, federal national parks, uh, not allowed to fly in those state parks depends on the state here in North Carolina state parks. Technically you can't local parks you usually can, but understand your state rules, understand, get the software that tells you where you can fly and find some good shots. There you go. Which famous person in history would you want to spend the day with? Um, I think it would probably, this is kind of weird, but Abraham Lincoln. Um, it just, he seemed kind of like a guy who didn't put up with a lot of BS, right? And, and just kind of wanted to do the right thing and push things forward. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of like that, right? Like, how do you get around? I mean, I don't know how he was a politician given his life and stuff. Um, so really interesting that way. And uh, yeah, I think I would probably choose him. There you go. And our last question for you today, Chris, what's your favorite ice cream topping? Uh, peanut butter sauce. Nice. It completes pretty much any ice cream you can imagine. Not sherbet, but just about any ice cream. You can. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we do appreciate it, uh, Chris. Thanks for your time and uh, sharing some of your thoughts. If folks want to connect with you on social media, how do they do it? All right. So we got Twitter, BizDataViz. Um, just hit over a thousand followers. Uh, you can look up my name too. That's the other way to find it. LinkedIn, uh, heavy user of LinkedIn. And then I've got a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash BizDataViz. Very good. And we'll make sure those get up on the show notes page at singlelatedpartners.com slash speaking. And Mr. Kevin, how do folks reach out to you? Um, if you leave your contact information on one of those uh, forms that, that they give you at the end of a conference, then I probably will not read it. <laughs> but that's still the best way to contact me. <laughs> or a message in a bottle. You could also try that. There we go. Yes, maybe it'll show up next next uh, episode. Leave a five star review in a bottle. Throw it on the beach. I'll probably, I'll probably find it. <laughs> Love it. And I am also on LinkedIn, Compañeros. You can reach me at Carlos El Chicon. Um, thanks again for tuning in to today's session. We do appreciate it. If you, there's something you want to talk about, please let us know. We are interested in getting that feedback. Uh, again, please remember the uh, the seasonal series. Uh, coming up here and our sequel trail event in October. And with that, I'll see you on the sequel trail. Bye, y'all. Bye, guys. Thanks. Data Partners.